Hello everyone and welcome to episode two of Cycling Research Reviews. And for the first paper of the series, I feel it is most appropriate to cover what I think is the most widely cited or almost the most widely cited paper from 2008 by Pucher and Bueller, titled Making Cycling Irresistible, Lessons from the Netherlands, Denmark and Germany. As some of you know, I currently live in the Netherlands to study cycling here, and it is rather peculiar why in the northern European countries there is so much more cycling than uh, in most other developed countries around the world. In this classic with 545 cross-ref citations, the last time I checked, um, it outlines, first of all, that uh, there's a great disparity in the percentage of uh, trips being taken by cycling across countries. Um, at the top, we have the Netherlands at 27%, uh, at Denmark, 18%, and Germany at 10%. Now, what is peculiar is that then we go all the way down the list with more European countries, and we see that Australia, the United States, and Canada and Ireland, they hover around 1% or 2%. Interesting. That's a very big difference. So we have countries that where almost all the population have the experience or are exposed to cycling to places where cycling is rather marginalized. And Pucher and Bueller tries to look at some of the factors that might explain this phenomenon. Now, uh, what are some potential factors. They looked at uh, things like income, car ownership, uh, perhaps trip distances, and none of these seem significant, right? We're all looking at high income countries and even in places like the US where uh, distances are very large across uh, some of the more suburban parts of the country, it, once you normalize for that, it doesn't really seem to explain the drastic difference between 1% and 27% of uh, mode share. So they say even controlling for trip distance, however, the Dutch, Danes, and Germans make a much higher percentage of their local trips by bike. Interesting. The cycling demographic in places with a higher mode share is also more diverse. There's a wider variety of uh, ages cycling and uh, the gender gap is very different. Places with lower rates of cycling, it's almost all men. And in, in the case of the Netherlands, uh, there are more women than men who cycle. Hmm. Could this be due to the uh, feeling of safety, perhaps. They say f fatality rates per trip and per kilometer are much lower for countries and cities with a higher cycling mode share of total travel. Fatality rates fall for any given country or city as cycling rates rise. <laughs> and then they go on to talk about helmets. Now, I think it's uh, peculiar, actually, uh, Dutch cyclists don't wear helmets, yet it's one of the safest places in the world to cycle. Huh. So that's the first part of the paper where they basically go through a number of factors and come up short. So what is it then, right? Uh, they then move on to policy and different types of interventions. And that's what to which they dedicate their second half of the paper. So they come up with seven, okay? So one uh, extensive system of separated cycling facilities and two interaction, intersection modifications and priority traffic signals, three traffic calming, four bike parking, five coordination with public transport, six uh, traffic education and training, and seven traffic laws. We'll kind of briefly touch each of these points uh, in this video. And then uh, we'll move on to the other things that they mention. So an extensive system of separate cycling facilities. And indeed, yes, 
there is an extensive system here and uh, under the program of sustainable safety uh, i'm going to talk from the dutch context in fact any uh, urban road that's over 30 kilometers an hour or rural road over 60 kilometers an hour speed limit uh, must and do have separated facilities uh, and where the speeds are relatively low then uh, that's where traffic calming comes in which is uh, point number three so you have either separate facilities or uh, aggressive traffic calming and that in combination seems to um, control the speed uh, to a suffi sufficient degree so that cyclists feel safe and of course the intersection design here is drastically different uh, than most intersections whereas in most places you have a two vehicle system i'd say so pedestrian signals and then a general traffic signal here in the netherlands you have an additional set of signal for cycling and at most intersections uh w with a high speed road involved you do have a clear path or and yield rules for who yields to who uh with very good sight lines traffic calming we just covered uh bike parking right so uh it seems like you do need a place to put these bikes if you have a lot of bikes. Now, uh, as e-bikes become more popular and e-bikes are very expensive, uh, the question of having secured bike parking becomes even more important. Right? It's one thing to lose your 50 euro bike at the train station, but uh, to lose a thousand euro bike does take a hit on your wallet. Um, here, I think in the Netherlands, they, they have it rather down pat, this issue of bike parking. They have double-decker, they have uh, these grades separated, uh, they separate out the bikes so you can fit more in. Um, so that seems to be uh, an area where it's re done rather well. And add to that fact that a lot of people free lock their bikes here too. So you don't, sometimes there's no pole to lock to, but that's not a problem. Uh, coordination with public transit. Um, I'd say most of my trips are a uh, combination between the cycling and the train system. And in a future video, we'll explore that. We'll explore uh, why cycling and uh, let's call it rapid transit uh, complement each other and uh, how cycling and local transit can, because of their similar speeds, are actually competitors. So to get this coordination right, and to make it easier to transfer from cycling to uh, longer distance public transit is key to making uh, this other non-automobile part of the transportation system work really well. Then we have traffic education and training. Um, uh, here the kids get taught how to bike in traffic when they're young. I perhaps wouldn't recommend that in a place where it's absolutely not safe to cycle in traffic, but. Once the infrastructure is there, then training is perhaps a, a good way to go. And finally, traffic laws. Traffic laws, even traffic laws that uh, acknowledge uh, cycling as a distinct mode of transport uh, and not trying to lump it in with automobiles or um, pedestrians. Also, traffic laws that recognize rights of the cyclist. For example, in uh, Dutch traffic law, you can cycle uh, side by side. And that's, uh, that's near the, the front of the law, right? So just to, to cycle side by side then gives you uh, a feeling of comfort and be able to be social on the road. Uh, Pucci and Bueller then go on to talk about uh, taxation, parking, and land use. Now, I find this rather peculiar and these factors are less settled. Um, in a place like UK, which still has a very European and compact historic city structure, uh, they do have the density there. It's a dense country, but cycling rates are uh, as low as those of North America and Australia. Why? Why is that the case? I don't know. Uh, it seems like density alone uh, it doesn't work. So just having very compact spaces um, it doesn't automatically lead to more cycling, but it does seem to be to some extent necessary. Uh, places like uh, Tokyo, they, they have cycling there, very dense, and uh, 
London, they have more cycling. Um, but it's not always clear and it's not a direct relationship. Sometimes you have a lot of density, but instead of cycling, you get much higher levels of public transport use and they seem to be competing factors. The other thing that might surprise you is that the, the Dutch have the densest motorway network in Europe. And investment in automobile infrastructure is by no way low. They have very well maintained roads. They have very well maintained uh, parking facilities. And I think in the, the yeah, in the most recent TomTom Tom survey, the Netherlands was voted the most uh, pleasant place to drive uh, for a motorist. So here you have uh, a system where many things work in the transport sector. So you have uh, drivers who are happy, you have uh, many cyclists, and you have a pretty extensive train system too. So whereas in Dutch cities you have uh, many pedestrianized urban centers, um, they are complemented by parking garages on the periphery, making it so that it's still easy to access by car, except for a few walking streets. Yes, there's no through routes through the city center, but uh, driving a car to the city center and doing your shopping, etc., is not a problem. You do have to pay, um, but uh, it, it is an interesting thought that perhaps in the UK where uh, the, the pedestrianization of city centers is not as extensive, um, there is maybe still room for cycling, despite that fact. Indeed, this issue is uh, complex, and Peter and Bueller conclude by highlighting that the key to the success of cycling policies in the Netherlands, Denmark, and Germany is the coordinated implementation of the multifaceted, multi mutually reinforcing set of policies, end quote. Uh, this paper, I think, is a very important step forward into naming and conceptualizing um, and uncovering the different variables that go into uh, making uh, cycling work or not work, or as Pucher and Bueller call it, irresistible. But that was 2008, and much work has been done since then exactly what out of these factors makes cycling irresistible and how they interact is still a matter of debate. Uh, furthermore, uh, what does a country like the Netherlands do to go from 27% uh, mode share as current to perhaps 30, 35, 40%? What do you do? Uh, they've been able to do this historically um, at the turn of the century and back in the 1930s where many more trips were made by bike when the automobile wasn't as popular. Is it possible to recover to that level? Is it desirable? And if so, uh, what is it that makes cycling truly irresistible for a place where many people already cycle? So I'll leave that as an open question and uh, we'll explore this issue further in our next episodes. So thanks for joining me uh, to think about this. I encourage you to click on the link below to the original paper, read for yourself. And it's something very, and there are very important lessons to be drawn in there. So I'll see you next time and uh, take care till then.